Hey everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at chapter 15 from the Road to Latin textbook. And this story is called Domicilium Urbanum. So before we dive in, like I always tell you, if you want to see the story in a different way or just get more resources to help you on it, feel free to check out Nova Latin on my website. You can find a digitized version of it there. You can find the story um, you know, with the different cases highlighted, English translations, um, vocab list, practice, vocab practice, grammar notes, all this stuff. So it's everything that would help you uh, through this textbook. Feel free to take a look. Um, if you just want some more help as you work your way through. But before we dive into this story, um, the first thing I always tell you is make sure you have the vocab under control. So whether that's doing it on your own or, like I said, using my textbook, find a way to get the vocab and memorize as much of it as you can. It's really tricky to learn a new story and read the Latin when you don't know what the words are. So that should always sort of be step one. The other thing you want to do is work your way through the grammar. Even if you're not perfect at it, read through the grammar notes um, and try to just understand it as best you can. The good thing about the story is the story will kind of bring the grammar to life and give you a lot of practice on it. But it's still always a good idea to at least have seen it and you worked your way through it um, you know, once over at least. Just so you can kind of anticipate what you're going to be seeing in the story. It's always a good idea. And again, my website has a bunch of different notes that will help you out with that and different practice problems. So feel free to take advantage. Once you've done those things, the last thing I always tell you, is try to read the story aloud. So you can always read it um, on your own, right? Just take it, speak it, um, you know, read it aloud. That way you're working on your pronunciation. Always a good idea. It's better though if you can find someone from class or a partner, anyone to be able to help you with this. It's always a really good idea. Um, and if you have someone else to read it to, they can read it back to you. So you're not just practicing your speaking, but you're also practicing your listening. Those speaking and listening skills, you never want to shut off because they'll help you um, with the language, catching the patterns and really understanding the Latin. But once you're in that spot, you're in a really good place to start up and dive in and really make some sense of the story. But since this is a new chapter and I mentioned the grammar, I want to give you a quick grammar overview before we get into the translation of the story. So the grammar for chapter 15 is on first and second declension adjectives. So we've actually been using adjectives throughout the first 15 chapters, but we're really going to bring it together and kind of understand what they are and how to use them. So remember, adjectives describe nouns. That's their basic function. And Latin adjectives, just like nouns, are put into groups, which we call declensions. And that's the same terminology we use for Latin nouns. So nouns and adjectives both fall into groups and we call them declensions. Okay. So the first group of adjectives that we're studying are called first and second declension adjectives. Now, the reason we call them that, it seems like a clunky name. It's because they actually use the exact same endings as first and second declension nouns. So in other words, they're using what we call the us, a, um endings. Us is masculine, a is feminine, and um is neuter. And you can see in the chart below, um, it's matching exactly what we know from our noun ending chart, right? And this is why a lot of times the adjectives that we've seen have been using the same ending as the noun they're going with. Words like puella romana, for instance, right? Roman girl. That's kind of what's happening here. But for the basics, you want to understand that we have different groups of adjectives. And the first one is just called first and second declension. Okay, so when you're using uh, the adjectives, you're using a process that we call noun adjective agreement, which again sounds a little grammary or jargony, but the idea is pretty simple. You basically match an adjective to the noun it's going with. So Latin adjectives on their own don't have one set gender, right? They're kind of like chameleons. They match whatever they're going with. So adjectives can be masculine, feminine, and neuter, right? They have those three different forms. It's not just one set thing. This is the opposite to nouns, right? Nouns have one set gender. So in other words, the word girl will always be feminine in Latin. In, uh, in adjectives or in terms of adjectives, that's not the case, okay? So when we match an adjective and describe a noun with it, we call this agreement, right? We say they agree with each other. And there's three ways that adjectives need to match nouns, okay? It's case, number, and gender. So case just means how it's being used, right? Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, ablative, vocative, okay? So in other words, if I'm using, uh, if I'm describing a nominative case noun, I'm going to use a nominative case adjective. That's the idea. Number just means singular or plural, right? So if I have a singular noun, I need a singular adjective. Plural noun, plural adjective. Makes sense. And gender is the last way. So if I have a neuter noun, I need my neuter adjective. And if I have a feminine noun, I need a feminine adjective. This actually should sound kind of familiar. We don't do this exact thing in English, but the number part we definitely do. So it's kind of a remnant of noun adjective agreement. So if you think of English, you wouldn't say, oh, I see three boy today. Well, you can't see three boy because three is a plural adjective and boy is a singular noun. There's something wrong with the number. You'd say three boys. The same way you wouldn't say, oh, yeah, there goes one girls, 
right? How can you have one girls? One is singular, girls is plural. That's a remnant in English that might help you wrap your head around this idea because otherwise it can seem a little foreign. And I will say this is where a lot of my students struggle in class trying to wrap their head around noun adjective agreement because it just seems so different from what we do in English. But that's why we try to put it into these rules. If you can just remember, whenever you have an adjective, match it with case number and gender, you'll probably be in a pretty good place. And this is what it looks like when you put it into practice, right? This is why we say things like Tullia est femina romana, right? Tullia is a Roman woman. But you'd say Cornelius est puer romanus, right? Cornelius is a Roman boy. The word Roman, that adjective, is spelled two different ways. So in other words, in sentence one, we have Romana. Why is it Romana? Because it's describing Femina, right? Femina is um, feminine, so Romana is feminine. It's using the A ending. In the second line, we have Ro Roman, Romanus, describing puer. Puer, meaning boy, is a masculine word. So we need the masculine form of the adjective. So this is what we're saying, that adjectives have different endings, and it depends on what they're going with. Romana and Romanus mean the exact same thing. They both mean Roman, but they're spelled differently because they're describing two different nouns. And that's what you want to keep track of as you go. Okay? The good thing for us is we've only seen first and second declension nouns, right? And since we're using first and second declension adjectives in this chapter, it means for the most part, the only adjectives you're going to see are going to use the exact same ending as your noun. The reason for that is because first and second declension adjectives have the same endings as first and second declension nouns. So you're going to see as you go through, um, <clears throat> adjectives really aren't that difficult so far because we're using the same ending, so it's going to match, right? Like in this first sentence, femina romana. And I'll point it out as we go through the story, and it gets a little more complicated um, when you add different declensions of nouns and different types of adjectives. But for now, we're keeping it pretty simple, right? The adjective is going to match the noun. That's really all you need to know. So let's dive in. And again, if that was a little confusing, go back, read through the grammar um, from chapter 15, the notes, <clears throat> get a little practice. But I think you're in a good place to dive into the story and kind of see this in action. So chapter 15 starts, we're talking about Roman houses, right? You have Romae, Cornelius Magnum Domicilium Urbanum Habe. So Romae here is locked, if you're saying in Rome, right, or at Rome. Cornelius has, Cornelius is my subject, Habet's my verb, he has. What does he have? A Magnum Domicilium Urbanum, right? A big urban house, basically is it. So the noun here is Domicilium, okay? Now Domicilium is being matched by two adjectives, magnum and urbanum. And you notice that they're all using the UM ending. That's the noun adjective agreement idea, right? They're all matching the case number and gender of domicilium, which in this case is going to be neuter accusative singular. So they're all kind of matching. So this is why it's not too, too bad right now to see where the adjectives are. The spelling is telling you that magnum cannot possibly be describing Cornelius. We're not saying big Cornelius has a house. No, no. Magnum is describing domicilium. And you can hear hear it. This is why I tell you to read the story. You can hear it in the uh, the pronunciation, right? Magnum domicilium. That makes more sense than Cornelius magnum, right? Us and um, it doesn't quite sound right. So by speaking this aloud, you probably catch it. And by looking at it, you can figure out which word the adjective is describing. Then it continues. You have dominus domina filii filii servi servi in domicilio magno habitant. So we have a bunch of subjects here. You're saying the master, dominus, the mistress, domina, the, the sons, filii, the daughters, filii, the slave men, serwi, and the slave women, serwi, they all habitat. They live in domicilio magno, in the large house. And again, magno is describing domicilio. You can see how the endings match. In this case, they're both ablative singular, right? Neuter ablative singular. So they're both, uh, both using that O ending. Then you continue, you have Cornelius as Dominus Benignus, itaque servi Corneli diligente laborant. So here again, uh, this is something I mentioned before. I'm not a huge fan of how they kind of describe slavery in old textbooks, um, but we're going to work with it for what we have, right? We're not here to judge, uh, you know, the textbook from the 1930s, but I would say it's not you know, how we would really do it today. So just take that with a grain of salt. This literally says Cornelius is a Dominus Benignus, a kind master. So right off the bat, we have kind of a problematic statement there, kind master. I mean, it's not the most outrageous thing. I'm sure there were um, some Romans who were, who were pretty kind, but the idea of owning other people and saying you're kind is kind of a problematic thing to have. But benignus here, kind, is describing Dominus, right? The master. It's technically also describing Cornelius. They're all going together, but really it's going with Dominus. And you can tell by the endings, right? U.S. and U.S. They match. 
Then it continues. You have a takwe, and so, right? I mean, because he's a kind master. And so the serwi, there's your subject, the slaves, they diligente laborant. They work, laborant, diligente, diligently. And the, the slaves of Cornelius, Cornelius is genitive there. So saying, and so the slaves of Cornelius work hard. The implication here is they work hard because he is a kind master, right? Again, take this for what it is. It's not probably how I would have worded the story, but we're not here to necessarily judge the textbook. Just use it for what it is and understand that, you know, there's kind of some problematic stuff in it. Then continue, you have Tulia es domina benigna, itaque serwa tulia diligente labora. So here we have basically a repetition of the same sentence. We're just changing the details around a little bit. So you're saying Tulia is a kind mistress. Notice here how we went from dominus benignus to domina benigna. This is because Tulia is a woman. So we're using the feminine form of these nouns and adjectives. So there's a good example. You wouldn't say domina benignus the same way you wouldn't say dominus benigna, right? Something's wrong. The gender needs to match. So here, domina and benigna are both feminine nominative singular, right? Case number gender is matching. And so because she's a kind mistress, you're saying the slave women of Tulia, ser y tuliae, they work hard, labora diligente. Then we continue on. You have magnum domicilium est domino et dominae gratum. So the big house, the magnum domicilium, is gratum, right? Gratum is the adjective describing domicilium. You can tell by the UM ending. It's pleasing. Now, this word pleasing, this adjective, is one of the special ones that we said it goes with the dative because something is pleasing to someone. So our two dative nouns here are domino et dominae. So it's pleasing to the master and the mistress. Then we continue of Roma sunt multa domicilia magna. So in Rome, there are many big um, houses, domicilia magna. And notice here how when we went plural, domicilium became domicilia. That's the neuter nominative plural. And my adjectives changed. So instead of magnum and, uh, sorry, multum and magnum, we have multa and magna. They're describing domicilia. They're matching in case number gender, which in this case is neuter nominative plural. Now we continue. You have servi et servi in domicilio corneli libente laborant, quo dominum et dominam amat. So the slaves and slave women, right, they work, laborant, libente, they graciously or kind of happily work, again, kind of an odd sentence here, um, in the domicilio corneli, in the house of Cornelius. So it's saying they're working kind of happily. Again, the happy slave um, reference is kind of an odd one, but it's what we have, right? They're working happily because amat, they like the dominum at dominum. They like the master and mistress. And again, here's uh, another one. I, I know I keep saying this, but I want you to just think about these sentences, right? Um, and kind of the problems with them. I, I guess you could have a slave that likes their master. It seems kind of an odd thing to say that you like or love the person who owns you, but you know, sure, whatever. Um, I, I, I kind of have a problem with it, but again, it, it's, it's an old textbook. Um, so just take it for what it is. Let's try not to pass our judgments necessarily. Let's take it and say, you know what, this isn't how I would um, you know, necessarily word it, but let's look into it. And I would encourage you to look up the dynamic of how slavery worked in ancient Rome. It'll give you a better sense of what's going on here. Then you have Sextus est servus. So Sextus is a slave. Sextus non est liber, said non est miser, quo dominus est benignus. So you're saying Sextus is not free, non est liber, but he is not, non est miser, miserable. Because Dominus Espiting this, his master is kind. So again, they're trying to get at the mentality of a slave, um, saying that they're not free, but they're also not miserable because they have a kind master. Again, sure, right? Take it for what it is. But you'll notice how benignus, kind, is describing Dominus, and they both have the same ending. That's the noun adjective agreement. Okay? Then you have Sextus non est piger, itaque Dominus Sextum Saipe Lauda. Okay. So here we have an interesting um, line with the, the adjective piger, right, which means lazy. So um, this is kind of interesting. We'll see as we go what's going on with this adjective. Take lazy as its own sort of thing and just understand it's describing sexist. I know it doesn't match with the U.S. ending, but it's still describing it. You're saying sexist is not lazy. And so the master, Dominus, often praises saipe laudat sextum, right? He often praises him because he works hard. He's not lazy. And again, that wording of a, a lazy slave is kind of odd, but again, you know, take it for what it is, all right? So it's saying that the slaves work hard because their master is nice and they like him, okay? Then you have Cornelius, multos et bonos servos habet. 
So Cornelius has many good slaves. Literally, it says many and good, but you can kind of take them together. You're just saying these two adjectives, multos et bonos, are describing servos, the slaves. And you notice how they match, right? The OS endings are all matching. That's the case number and gender um, match. So servos is accusative masculine plural. So multos and bonos are both accusative masculine plural. And you can tell by the endings they can't possibly be describing Cornelius, which is nominative singular, right? The endings don't match. It wouldn't sound right. So you're not saying good Cornelius has slaves. You're saying Cornelius has good slaves, right? Many good slaves. Then you continue. You have Seri Boni, non sunt mi beri, said non sunt mi seri. So the slaves, right, the good slaves, again, notice how Boni is matching Seri, right, case number gender. The good slaves are not free, liberi, but they're not miserable, mi seri. And notice how the long eyes are all matching with Seri. Again, it's mimicking the sentence you just saw, just pluralizing it. Then you have Seri, non sunt pigri, right? The slaves are not lazy. Maria, non est libera, quod est serva. So now we have a new um, slave, a slave woman, Maria, right? Maria is not free, non est libera. And notice how the word free, libera, is describing Maria, right? They have an A. That's, it's the same adjective as liberi in the previous sentence, or the, the second uh, from the previous sentence. But because we're describing a woman, right, a slave woman, it's singular, it's libera with, a, with an A, as opposed to liberi, which was describing slaves, right? So this is the idea of the adjectives need to match. Then you have Tulia es domina benigna, itaque Maria non est misera. So Tulia is a kind mistress, a domina benigna. And again, notice how the adjective ending matches the noun. And so Maria non est misera, she's not miserable. Maria non est pigra, right? Maria is not lazy. Same thing. Notice how the adjective, it was piger when you're describing a man. Pigra is describing Maria because she's a woman, right? She's not lazy. Then you have Tulliae Serwai, Sunt Neque Miserai Neque Pigrai. So the slaves of Tulia. And here you'll notice Tulliae has that AE ending. It has to be genitive because there's not more than one Tulia. And um, no one's giving something to Tulia. So it couldn't be dative either. The ending that makes the most sense here in the context is genitive singular. You're saying the slaves of Tulia are Sunt Neque Miserai Neque Pigrai. They're neither miserable nor lazy. So the idea is there's a lot of apparently good slaves in this house, right? Nobody's lazy. Everyone works hard. That's kind of what this story is getting at. Then you have, um, Servi et servi non sunt miseri, quod dominus et dominus sunt benigni. So here again, the slaves and slave women, they are not miserable. Now notice how we have miseri here. So miseri is technically matching servi. So the reason we did that is um, usually in Latin, uh, when you have a mixed sort of gender um, subject, so you have slaves and slave women, you default to the masculine ending. So if you have um, men in the group, it tends to go masculine. That's what you're seeing here. So if you're wondering why miseri is technically describing serwi, it's because it's really describing serwi, right? They're kind of going together. So you're saying the slaves and slave women are not miserable because the dominus, the master, and the domina, the mistress, are kind, benigni. And notice how we use the long I ending. It's because we have two people, the master and mistress, so it has to be plural. And since one of them is male, we use the masculine ending. So benigni is masculine nominative plural. That's what's going on there. Then you continue, you have servi et servi sunt laiti, quote in domicilio pulcro habitan. So the slaves and slave women are happy. Same thing's happening here. Laiti is masculine nominative plural. It's because you have more than one people, servi et servi, and one of them is masculine. So you're going with the masculine ending. So you're saying the slaves and slave women are happy because they live, habitan, in a domicilio, a house, and it's described as pulcro, a beautiful house. And notice how the endings match, domicilio, pulcro. They're both ablative singular neuter right? So they're happy to live in a beautiful house. Then you continue, of liberi, lighty, domicilium, pulcrum, amat. So here we have the liberi, the children, and they're lighty liberi, the happy children. So again, you're saying the happy children, amat, they like or love, <coughs> excuse me, the domicilium, pulcrum, the beautiful house. Then we have <coughs> in domicilio, peristilum, pulcrum, est. So in the house, there is a beautiful peristyle. So that's sort of like a courtyard with columns holding it up, right? A, col a colonnade, you might say. So it's part of why they find it beautiful. And then we end with this last part. You have altai columnae peristylum circumstant. So high columns, altai columnae. <clears throat> and notice how altai is matching columnae, right? A-E ending. So high columns um, are, are around or stand around circumstant, the peristylum, right? The peristyle.
And maybe surround is a good way to do uh, kirkumstan. Same idea. So it surrounds it. Then you have in peristilo est hortus pulcher. So in the peristyle, there's a beautiful garden. Okay. Liberos peristilum delecta quod est apertum. So the peristyle, there's your subject, delights the children. Liberos is accused of plural because it is open est apertum. And notice how apertum is describing peristilum and they have the same ending, right? The peristyle is open. Then you have domicilium pulcrum cornelium et tuliam et liberos delectat. So the beautiful house, the domicilium pulcrum, it delights Cornelius, right, and Tulia and the children. Notice how pulcrum is describing domicilium. And again, it's about the adjective uh, matching the noun. Then you have domicilia pulcra, dominis romani semper sunt grata. So beautiful houses always are pleasing, grata, right, semper sunt grata. And again, grata is one of those special adjectives that takes a dative. They're pleasing to someone. They're pleasing to Roman masters, dominis romanis. Then you have multi inculi Italiae magna domicilia urbana habet. So many inhabitants, multi inculi And here you might pause and be like, well, Mr. C, there's something wrong here. The trick is inculi is technically masculine. So you always want to check the gender of your noun. It's one of those few words that's technically first declension. So it uses, you know, the A ending, A-E here. But it's a masculine noun. So that's why you have multi going with it. It's about matching the gender. So it looks a little odd. That's just sort of a, um, a wild card one that you'll get used to. It's an exception. But you're saying many inhabitants of Italy have, habit magna domicilia urbana, um, big urban houses, right? Domicilia urbana. Then you have Lyca domicilium pulcrum habet. So Lyca has a domicilium pulcrum, a beautiful house. Lyca est poeta clarus et multum pecunium habet. So Lyca is a poeta clarus, a famous poet. And again, notice how we have something wrong here with the A in the US. It's because poeta is another one of those exception words. Um, poet is technically masculine. So Poeta is masculine nominative singular, even though it ends in an A. So that's why you have claros there, right? The, the masculine adjective. So he's a famous poet and he has habet multam pecunium. He has a lot of money. Agricoli Romani multam pecuniam non habet. So here's our third exception, right? They're trying to give you different exceptions to the rule. Agricoli means farmers, masculine word. So Romani is masculine nominative plural. Agricoli is also masculine nominative plural. So you're saying Roman farmers do not have non habet multam pecuniam, a lot of money. Itaque domicilia pulcra non habet. So in so domicilia pulcra, right? Um, beautiful houses, known habit, they don't have. So if you put it back together, domicilia pulcra is your um, direct object. You're saying they don't have beautiful houses. So someone who's famous and has a lot of money would have a beautiful house, right? But people who don't have a lot of money don't have the beautiful house. That's kind of the idea. Then you have multi agricoli vias urbanas timent, itaque in casis rusticis habitat. So there's my subject again, multi agricoli. And again, agricoli is masculine, nominative, plural. That's why it's going with multi. It looks a little weird. It's just an exception. Right. Um, so you're saying uh, many farmers, they fear the streets of the city, the city streets, the weas urbanas. Right. So they're afraid of the city streets. And so they live habitat in casis rusticis, in country cottages, you might say. And notice how the adjective rusticis is describing casis. They're both ablative plural. So you have this matching going on again. OK, so this chapter is really about houses and just showing where people live, what a Roman house might look like. I'd recommend if you're interested, take a look at my culture unit on Roman houses and on slavery. Again, the slave element is, is really hard to, to get past, but it's showing you what houses might be like, um, who would live in different houses. So there's a good culture unit you can unpack here. But in terms of the grammar, the story is really about uh, getting used to adjectives and seeing how adjectives match. So when you read through the story, look at all the adjectives figure out what word it's matching and try to really understand why, right? Look at your different charts, nouns, and adjective endings and make sure that they're matching in case, number, and gender. That's the idea you're really after. And the more you read it, the more you're going to realize that most of the time, right, the endings just match. So you'd say something like multi-Romani. You're like, oh, that makes sense. The times where it doesn't, like multi-Incoli or Agricoli Romani, these are times where we want to pause and really dive into it and understand that they do technically match in case number gender. They just look a little different because you have some exceptions. OK, so hopefully this story made some sense. Again, if it's not making sense, feel free to put a comment uh, below and I'll help you however I can. But the best thing you can do is master the vocab, really dive into the grammar and then read this story a bunch of times. So if you read it at first and you don't understand it, go back and reread it. Um, that read and reread strategy is a really powerful one. 
So maybe you read it the first time, write any words you don't understand, any sentences that you're confused on, then pause, look up what's going on in these sentences and read it again. And the second time through or the third time through, you should really be uh, getting better at the Latin and understanding what's going on. That's how you develop your reading skills. So do what you have to do. Again, if you need any help, let me know. But otherwise, keep at it and good luck.